we have a faith, and it is not a blind faith. Uh, many people believe that Christianity has a blind faith, that you blindly just go along with whatever you're taught, and they normally say to Christians, that, why don't you go read some book, read some biology, or read some chemistry? And it's hard to tell them that we went to college, we did biology in college, we did um, do chemistry in high school and physics and all that. We did all of that, and it didn't do anything for us. Because if biology and chemistry does not solve the problem of the human nature, it doesn't deal with the sin problem, it doesn't deal with the problems of society. What it does, it, uh, it gives us some, some chemistry, gave, gives me this laptop, the shell of it, the plastic. They take crude oil and they make um, this laptop shell with it. That's what chemistry does. Now, how does that solve the problems of humanity? It doesn't solve the problem. Man is still a killer, even if you give him a laptop. And so we want to look at this thing called the evidence for faith, that faith is based upon evidence. And like what we did last night, we're going to go right back into where we started from, and then we're going to go into our presentation for the morning. So we'll do this with, start with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, again for your love towards us and for being holy, dear Father, and being faithful to thy word and uplifting thy word even above thy name. I pray that you may bless us that we too in our lives might look at thy word and treat it the way you treat it and that we too may be um, like thee in character. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the evidence for faith. Now, we start back again with where we're going to start in each presentation. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, we'll look at faith. Faith has substance. Um, similar to what we talk about with circumstantial evidence. Based upon a set amount of evidence, you come to a conclusion. And so when we say we have faith and we believe in God and we serve and worship the unseen God, we're not um, stating that says we did see God, we did hear God, we did talk to God personally. But we're basing our faith or we're basing our activities, what we do in worship, what we do in our personal life, based upon simply evidence. Our substance, the Bible used the word substance here. And these substance tells us that says something is greater than what we can see, touch, or hear. And so most people say they can't have faith, they can't believe in God because they cannot touch God, they cannot talk to God, and they can't see. But yet we do many things in life that is based upon um, things that are not tangible or things that are not substance. And so we believe that our faith is based upon substance and it's based upon evidence. But it's evidence of things not seen. Now, how can you have evidence of something not seen? Because you were not there. Somebody said, were you there at creation? No. Were you there at the crucifixion? No. But I believe in it. Am I there at the second coming? No, because it's future. But I believe it will happen. And so I'm basing my faith upon some substance and some evidence. And so this evening, I'm going to present to you some evidence about the second coming. And at the second coming, I believe it's future. But I'm basing upon substance, and I'm basing upon evidence. And we're going to look at some evidence this evening. And then from those evidence, I'm going to conclude that what the Bible says will happen in the future will happen. And based upon those evidence and those substance, we said that we believe that God created the heavens and the earth. And based upon the substance and evidence, we believe that say, Christ died on the cross for my sin. And if those evidence and substance hold through, true, then I can go onward and believe that says there is some validity to faith and I can practice faith and be reassured that the faith I'm practicing is rock solid. And so in Romans chapter 10 verse 13 through 17 it says, for whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever. So if you call upon the Lord you shall be saved. So the question is then how could somebody call upon the Lord and be saved if they don't know anything about the Lord? And so verse 14 says, how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a what? Preacher. So I'm standing here in front of you today as the person who is a preacher. So the question you ask is, why am I standing in front of you preaching? Why am I here? Well, Paul continues to talk. He says, how shall they preach except they be what? Sent. So I believe that I'm sent. And I'm sent to preach. And it continues, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of what? Good things. Now, if you sell my feet, you would say, I don't think his feet is beautiful. It's not beautiful probably to look at, but it's beautiful because, again, what I'm bringing. You're happy to see my feet. Now, when you see certain people's feet in your house, if they're not bringing good news, are you happy? 
No, so you don't think their feet are beautiful. So you think my feet is beautiful because I'm preaching. So it is preaching based upon those who sent. Now verse 16, because it's not just good enough to preach, it's also important to be able to be preaching good news. Amen? Good news. But verse 16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah has said, Lord, who have believed our report? So Isaiah report. Now we're going to look at that. We just read the scripture reading. Jeremiah report, Moses report, all these different people report. And as they report of good things, not everybody believes. Not everybody believes. And that's what the Bible says, not everybody will be saved. But we are here to preach and give you a good report. And the report we are giving you is based upon what we have studied. And we believe that we are sent to preach it. And verse 17 say, so then, faith cometh by what? Are you hearing? Amen. Amen. If you're not hearing, then you need braille. You need something to communicate to you the gospel because you need to have faith. And remember, faith has substance and it has evidence. And we're looking at substance and evidence through the series. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So most naturally when we talk about the gospel, it is important if you have ears to ear that you hear. So am I clear? Can you hear me? Okay, so I'm going to turn up the volume. Because you need to hear. It's important to hear. Now, again, you hear and you look at the evidence that's presented. And then I ask you the question, can you make a determination based upon the evidence? And you're going to simply say yes or no. And that's the basis of Christian experience or the Christian life. You make a determination based upon the weight of evidence if you believe or not. And so we're presenting some things to you. And it comes to you first. You hear it and you think about it. And then based upon what you hear, then you make a determination if you can have faith. Because I had to do the same thing. And each and every person has to do the same thing. You have to basically weigh the evidence. And if the evidence bear on the side of believing in God and practicing the Christian religion, as it is outlined in the Bible, then you accept and you go right on ahead and believe. And so with that, we'll go into our presentation for um, this morning. Now, I'm looking at the gifts of prophecy because when you come into the Bible, one thing is very clear in the Bible, that the Bible states some things that is uh, mind-boggling. One of the things it states is that there's miracles. There's miracles. Now, most people have a problem with miracles. Remember the story of Jefferson, our founding father, Thomas, Thomas Jefferson. And he basically did his own Bible. What he did, he cut out every part in the New Testament that had a miracle or anything supernatural. And what he was left with was the things like the parables and the teachings of Jesus. He loved the teaching of Jesus. But what he couldn't take is that Jesus did miracles. So he didn't like miracles. Anything supernatural he couldn't touch. And that's because he's carnal. He does not understand anything that is higher and beyond what you can reason with. Because with miracles and with prophecy, which is what we're studying, you cannot reason with it. It's not very reasonable. Because it doesn't make sense with a natural man. It doesn't make sense with something. Because in order for me to, again, looking back at this laptop, have this laptop, somebody had to make the laptop. But with prophecy, it boggles the mind. Because I'm telling something, or I, the Lord is saying something that will happen in the future. But the future is not here. So how can he tell what's going to happen in the future if it's not here? And there's one thing for me to tell you what happened in the past, because the past is already gone. It's not tangible. The future is not tangible. It's not something that our mind can grasp. That it is possible to have a foreknowledge of something will happen in the future. Same thing when it comes on to the Bible. The Bible says in the beginning God created the what? The heavens and the earth. And most people, they start reading the Bible and they just fall apart right there at the first. Genesis chapter 1, the first book of the Bible, the first chapter of the Bible, and the first verse of the Bible blow people away all the time. Because they read it and say, how can something, how can something come out of nothing? That's not possible. And so when we look at prophecy, it's the same idea. How can something come out of nothing because the future is not here? It's not tangible. But God tells us that he comes to us and he comes to us in a unique way. And he communicates to us in a unique way through prophetic writing. That is something that we have to be able to deal with and we're going to be dealing with tonight in the seminar as we talk about the second coming. Because the second coming is future and we believe that it's going to happen and we base that upon substance and evidence. Now in Numbers chapter 12 verse 6 it states, And he says, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision and I will speak unto him in a dream. So here the Bible says that the Lord communicates to his prophets or to individuals and we believe that these individuals wrote the Bible and he communicated to them in dreams and he communicated them in vision. 
So this is how the Lord communicates there. And we can find these writings and these teachings in the Bible. And this is what we're going to study this evening. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, it says, In the first year of Belteshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and a vision of his head upon his bed. And then he wrote, you know what? He wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. So we find throughout the Bible, the Lord communicates to prophets and to various different individuals in dreams and in visions. And it, these dreams and visions, they were communicated about the future. Now, what are some of the physical phenomena that accompanied Daniel while in vision? Because Daniel, we say, is a prophet. He talks about the end time. He talks about world empires. He talks about a lot of things. What were accomplishing with him? And it says, Daniel chapter 10, verse 8, 8 through 10 says, Therefore, I was left alone, and I saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for the comeliness was turned into corruption, and I retain no strength. Now, that first text is important because, as you know, when it comes on to dream, when you dream, primarily for female, female do not experience any type of physical effect by now, the dream. Normally, when you wake up, you could sweat, but you will not basically have an experience where you um, you're, you're, you're lose all strength. Right? It is not, you never go to that level. And as I say, you could wake up frightened. You wake up on your sleep, you're frightened. You know something had happened, but you realize real quickly what happened. It is a dream. It is not real. And you, you go back to normal. In this situation, Daniel had a dream and it says he lost what? Strength. That's what he claimed. Now, you and I have to deal with this reality that say, why would Daniel make up such a thing? For what reason? What would motivate a person to talk about this reality? That is not normal. And yet, he, the, many people throughout the Bible claim the same thing. We keep going. And it says here, Yet heard I a voice of his word. And when I heard the voice of his word, then was I um, in a deep sleep and on my face and my face towards the ground. So I heard his voice and he was in a deep sleep. Does that talk about some physical activity that's going on with him? is having an experience as if he's awake, but he's sleeping. We find that says, Paul says the same thing. Paul says as he's having a vision or a dream, he says he don't know if he was there for real in heaven or he was there in a vision or a dream. The experience is so real that it is physically real to the person also. Verse 10 says, And behold, a man touched me, when, which set me upon my knee and upon the palms of my what? hand. What is that, real? Or in a vision. He's having an experience where he's literally, physically going through the dream as if a person is sleepwalking. But he's not sleeping. But he's sleeping. It make no sense, right? And so we find that says the point here is that it's not normal. Not supposed to be normal because it's something supernatural. It doesn't make sense to the average reasoning because something is happening to him that's beyond the, the normal. It's what we call a physical phenomenon. The person is physically going through it, but yet they're in a dream. And as I say, the first thing I know that everybody experiences, because I've read up about dreams, is that they know real quickly after they come out of the dream that it's not real. But in these dreams, Daniel says it's real. I'm in dream, I'm physically going through it, but I'm not going through it. I'm dreaming, but it's a physical reality. I went there. I saw it, Paul says, for myself. I saw it in my eyes. Not in dream, in vision. But I was in vision. It goes beyond the natural. Verse 17 and 18, to continue talking about the supernaturality of the Bible, it says, For how can the servant of thy Lord my God talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remaineth no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Now, this idea of bread left in me has been talked about as a physical phenomenon where the person literally is not breathing. They've, they've had it where they've tested people where they stop breathing and they're still alive. Stop breathing, no, no, no nothing, no breath coming out of them and they're still alive. It is a supernatural event. And verse 18, then they came again and touched me one like an appearance of man and he strengthened me. Life came back, he revived. This is not 
natural. And these are the things that the Bible talks about. That when people say they believe in the Bible or they would like to know more about the Bible, well, the first thing we're going to tell them, you're going to have to deal with the spirituality and the supernaturality of the Bible, especially when prophets had dreams. Now, who is the source of the messages that the prophets receive in vision? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, for the prophecy came not of old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. So the source that these men claim that they didn't make up these things themselves. Somebody say, oh, these are just make up stuff by themselves. Well, no, because what's the motivation for them to make up such a thing? Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants. The what? The prophets. So we believe that there's things that are secret. They're called mysteries that were revealed for our benefit by the hand of the servants of prophet. God moved them as we covered last night. And he gave them this information to bless us so that we can have some insight as to why we're here, what's going on in this world, what's the bigger picture. And we find that people in the Bible that are referred to as prophets are people like Enoch, Elijah, Elisha. John the Baptist were all a prophet. They received direct instructions, direct messages from the Lord, and a direct task. Some of them from they were young, some of them as they got older, to preach something that was unique. Now, why did God give the gift of prophecy to his New Testament church? This is important for us. Now, for us it's important because most people believe that prophetic, understanding the prophetic writings of the Bible is not important anymore because the prophetic writings in the Bible um, are something that happened in, um, back in the time of Jesus and it stopped. But we believe that the prophecies goes all the way to the second coming. So if it goes all the way to the second coming, why would the Lord stop revealing his will to us? Is it not more, not more important in these times of trouble for us to know what's going on and to have a clear revelation of what's going on? So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13, it says, and he gave some apostle and some prophets and some um, evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So everybody would agree, say, yeah, I believe that there's people who are teachers of the Bible and people who are pastors of the Bible, uh, pastor and she sheep, sheep, and also people who are evangelists. But yet we would not say that we believe that the Lord still um, has apostles and prophets. But we believe that the gift of the Spirit does this, where it leads a person. Remember I say that as I stand here, I stand as a preacher, because I believe that I'm being led by the Spirit to preach. But if you believe that, and that's possible to believe that a person could be a pastor or a teacher, it's possible to believe that the Lord will have and has have people who give direct instructions and direct prophetic teachings that he, they receive from God himself. And it says this is done for the church for the perfecting of the saints. Now, it's, that's important because the saints need to be perfected. Amen? For the work of the ministry. Now, the question to us here is, are these people given for them to do the work of the ministry or for them to teach the members to do the work of the ministry. And I believe it's both. Because most of the people say that the pastor is doing the work of the ministry. But we believe the members are supposed to be taught to do the work of the ministry. To be able to help in the gospel proclamation. For the edifying of the body, right? So the body of Christ needs to be what? Edified. How is it going to be edified? By these people who are brought forth to teach. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Right? And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a, perfect ma unto a perfect man, unto the measure of stature of the fullness of what? Of Christ. So somebody says, well, I'm not growing in Christ. Well, probably you're not growing in Christ because you don't have these people working to bless you. Somebody says, oh, no, I just need Jesus. Well, why Jesus would send these people? And so many churches believe that says, uh, that says they don't need prophet prophetic understanding. They don't need evangelist, pastor, teacher. And all these people do the work of the gospel, but they have a different fine-tuning for the success of the work of the gospel. All of them. See, a teacher functions different from a pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, evangelists function different from a, um, a pastor and a teacher. And a prophet functions different from a pastor, teacher, and evangelist. And a pastor is different. They all have different mode of work. They don't work the same way. They don't do the same task. Each of them do something different. But we believe that these things exist, but most people will not think that this still exists and it's important for the blessing of God's church. 
to give God's give God's church revelation from the throne of fire. But we continue. First Corinthians chapter fourteen verse three says, "But he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort." So when we look at the work of a prophet, the prophet just does not only prophesy future events. Does that make sense? The prophet also is working for edifying, so to clarify some things, to teach you some things. The prophet also works for exhortation and also for comfort. Does, does people need comfort? Yeah, so the prophet will work to do all of that stuff. And so this is needed. This is why the Lord gave us prophecy. Although our focus, we're getting towards this even, going towards second coming signs. But still, it's important to know that it says if the prophet is not just giving prophecy of the future, the prophet is also doing other work. Now, does the pastor does the same thing? If I go back, does the pastor edify, exhort, and comfort? Yes. Does the teacher edify, exhort, and comfort? Yes. Everybody does the same thing, but the prophet does something special. They deal with prophetic utterances. See, there's nuance, but everybody does the same ministry. So we continue. What warnings are given? Are we given concerning prophecy? In First Thessalonians chapter five, verse nineteen through twenty-one says, "Quench not the spirit, right? Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast to to that which is good." So here the Bible says, "Don't quench the spirit." Can you quench the spirit? Yes, a person can quench the spirit. A person can have this attitude that they're not interested. They're disconnected. They don't want to hear it. Shut down. Right? And that's them quenching the spirit. It says, this night, this part is not prophesying. So, again, I'm going to present to you, I'm presenting you the general topic of prophecy, but I'm presenting you some prophetic things in the evening. Now, as I present that, the Bible is saying that says you cannot despise it. Right? You cannot despise that. But the Bible gives us some protection. It says you must do what? Prove all things. Right? Because, again, it could be false prophecy. This is why we had read the scripture reading. Prove all things. And it says to hold fast to that which is what? Good. So if you prove it and you say this is good, hold it. Don't reject it. But if it's not good, guess what you have to do? Reject it. So hold fast to that which is good. Luke chapter 7 verse 15 says, Beware of what? False prophets which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are what? Ravenous wolves. Now, if the Bible says this, do you believe that this still stand to this day? Right. So, is that thing that says prophecy or the prophetic work will exist into the future? Yes. It tells us that the work of prophecy, the gift of prophecy, will continue until the end of the day. Because remember, there are true prophets and there are false prophets. But you have to test it. You have to prove what is good. And hold fast to that was not as good. And somebody say, Lord, so is it always that somebody come and say they have a, a prophetic a message from the Lord they received last night? Not necessarily. But even if the person says that, you say, well, let's not quench the spirit. Let's go ahead and hear your prophecy. But whatever person comes just with a message, says, you know, I read this, I have this Bible study, and it tells me that it says, this is how things are going to happen. You say, well, let's study it together. And let's prove the prophet. Don't quench it. And if it's not good, you don't hold fast to it because false prophets are gone out in the world. But if it's good, you hold fast to it. If it's not good, you reject it because they're ravening wool because ultimately they're going to do things to hurt us. And to this day, this is important to us because your, your understanding of prophecy and the future are just or aligned or lead you in the future or your today. How you understand what's going on. If, uh, as I said, we're going to look at some things today this evening and as you understand it you will say wait a minute then if that's going to happen I need to do this over here if that's going to happen I need to do this over here it depends it depends how you view prophecy now does the Bible predict the revival of the prophetic gift before the second coming uh, you know the answer for that is yes in Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 it says behold I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord we know Elijah was a prophet, and we believe that the prophetic gift or ministry of Elijah will be resurrected or revived in the last day. So we know that prophecy will be important, and this is why we believe in teaching and preaching prophecy. I believe this is a mainstay of the Bible. It's a unique way of how God communicates to his people. 
Now, Joel chapter 2, verse 28, a specific predict prediction about what will be happening um, in the end of time. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 31. And it says, And it shall come to pass um, afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. There we go back again to the dreams and vision. So this is a prophecy of not just individual, one person like Elijah or Elisha, but many people will be receiving visions and dreams and prophecy. Now, when we go back into the Old Testament, we find in the New Testament, and we go into the time of Acts and so forth, we find that there were many people that were getting dreams and vision. Because the more trouble arises, is the more the Lord needs to send instruction. Does that make sense? The more persecution arises. In the time of Acts, you read, there was a lot of persecution. So the Lord is really sending rapid, rapid information. Fast. You need to send it fast. Because your next move could mean your debt or your, 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 your life. It could mean you, you get locked up or you get free. So there was a lot of communication. We believe that this is where we're going to in the future, and we're going to talk, touch on that this evening again. And I'll show you that what's coming up next, the Lord will have to be able to do this. The Lord has to because the Lord ha will have to communicate to get people into out of some serious situation and also for the message to go forth with power. Now, in verse 29, it says, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth and blood and fire and pillar of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So we believe combined with the prophetic gift, we will see major signs of the second coming. And we've known that says this had happened to a small extent in the 1800, but this never happened to a major extent where there's massive signs in the sky, in the sun and the moon. I'm going to read it one more time to you again just for your thought. I will show my wonders in the heavens in, and in the, air, in the earth. Blood, fire, now I've not seen this, and pillars of smoke will be seen. The sun shall be turned into darkness. We have seen some elements of this before in the past, and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So we believe that there's going to be a major um, experience with this coming. Among what group of people will the prophetic gift appear? In George chapter 2, verse 32, it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be, sa be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord had said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So we believe that there will be a remnant. Now, what has always happened in history, and I might point this out to you as you think about these things, what has always happened in the history is that in Israel, whenever there was major rebellion, God always have a remnant amongst his people who are still listening to Bible teaching. But it was always a small number. So when we read Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the minor prophets, Amos, and Hosea, and Obadiah, and all these people, um, we find that these prophets or prophetesses, when they would give their message, they would be speaking, but not to the majority of Israel at the time. They were just speaking to the remnant, the small number of those who still, as he says, if the Lord had not left for himself a remnant, we would have been a Solomon. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wrought with the woman that went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God. Now, this is not a blanket statement that covers everyone. This is those who do what? Keep the commandment of God. It has to be an experience where they're keeping the commandment of God. So somebody said, well, you know, I'm a rem No, no, no. Are you keeping the commandment of God? And have the testimony of who? They have the testimony of Jesus. So they keep the commandment of God, and they have the testimony of Jesus. And we know the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, what is the testimony of Jesus? Revelation chapter 19, verse 10 says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is what? Spirit of prophecy. Now somebody said, what do you mean? Like Christ was prophetic. Yeah, you know, actually everything that Christ said was prophetic. I mean, there's, there's no prophet like Christ. Amen? Ain't no prophet like Christ. Now, why would I say that? Every time Christ would be preaching, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem to be what? Crucified. What is he talking about? Prophecy or not? Prophecy says, he says, today the scripture is fulfilling your what? 
yeah. hearing. So you have to know, what is he talking about? What scripture? It's prophetic. And so if you do not understand prophecy, you don't understand Jesus. So that's why next weekend I'm going to talk about um, the Lamb of God. And you understand that's all prophet, prophetic. When Christ was baptized, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Everything has to do with the testimony of Jesus Christ's prophecy. Now, how deeper does this get? I tell somebody that says, when you read Psalms and Proverbs, you're reading prophecy. It is not prophecy in the sense that says, on today, something going to happen and there's going to be an earthquake. Not that type of prophecy. But that says, if you dig a pit, dig one for yourself. Is that prophetic? Because God is saying, I say, if you don't dig one for yourself, you're going to drop in the pit that you dig for somebody else. See, that's prophetic. The Bible is prophetic in all its nature because it's predicting end results. It's predicting that if you do go to the left, something's going to happen. If you go to the right, something's going to happen. So the testimony of Jesus is, as it says here, the spirit of prophecy is the prophetic idea. Now, somebody say, why is that important to me? Well, that's important because, again, the Lord has given us a roadmap for the future, a roadmap for your life, a roadmap for salvation. And it's given it to us that when we understand the Bible is prophetic in its utterance, it is supernatural. It is not a natural book. It is something that is beyond what we think in the carnal or in the material. The Bible is not a natural book. It's a supernatural book. We have to know this. And we have the see that says when we accept Jesus, we're accepting someone that is teacher of prophecy. So when I talk about prophecy, I'm not talking about something that is some unique thing to my belief system. It's not unique. It is something that if you accept Christ, you're accepting the gift of prophecy. Now, somebody say, well, I've been in my church for many years, and I do not um, ever heard anybody talking about prophecy and all that type of stuff. Well, remember, the Bible says here, again, I'm going to read it to you. Say the dragon, Revelation verse 12, chapter 12, verse 17, said the dragon was wrought with a woman, and he meant, went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now, there's people who, you don't, they don't want to hear anything about prophecy. They want to hear motivational sermons. They want to hear about the future, future events in the world. All they want to hear about is some fairy tale or some children's story. Prophetic teaching is always accepted by the remnant. Remember, as I said before, it was the prophets that were teaching those people who were in Israel who were the remnant. The only the remnant was listening to the prophetic words. The rest of the people, they want to hear that. They wanted to just get excited over worship and make a lot of noise. But the prophets always had an audience. It was those who were interested in the prophetic word. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. There's some people you can't preach anything to them. No matter where you're at. So somebody says, if I was in the biggest mainline organization in America, probably the Southern Baptist, and I was preaching prophecy, the hypocrites would still not want to hear me. Not interested in it. Because they're not part of the remnant. Only the remnant is interested in what's going to happen next. Amen. Because if you're not living right, you don't want to know what's going to happen next. Because what's going to happen next is bad news to you. It's not good news. And I'm not preaching good news to you because you don't want to hear what I have to say. Because I'm going to tell you that what's coming next is a whipping for the wickedness that you're doing. Now, what are the biblical tests of a prophet? We need to understand this because you need to be able to discern even as I speak to you and other people speak to you. Now, Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 gives us the biblical um, example of a prophet. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. Now, that's important for us when we look at somebody preaching. If a person contradicts the writings of Moses and the writings of the prophets, if they contradict the writings of Jesus, there is no light in them. There is no truth. Now, somebody said, but they're powerful when they go and do prophetic teachings. No, they're not. Because you cannot, while teaching prophecy or teaching any Bible, contradict Moses or contradict the prophets. Now, somebody said, Did this, was this test applied to Jesus? Yes, it was. When you think about Jesus, was this test applied to him? Yes. They would always question him, how about, are you Abraham's seed? How about Moses' writing? How about the prophets? And Christ would always say, I have never come to break the Lord, the prophet. So somebody said, well, Lord, if he didn't come to break it, then I have a problem because I think the law and the prophet is done away with. Christ crucified it to the cross. Christ said, no, I didn't. I never crucified it to the cross. I fulfilled some things in the Bible that were predicted about me, but I never condemned or put down anything in the, prophet, in the prophecy. And that applies to us the same way. I cannot contradict a prophet that went before me. 
else I'm talking teaching error. I cannot contradict Moses. So somebody come and says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching prophecy, but I don't believe that, um, I don't believe that Jesus Christ was um, supernatural and he was God, came in the flesh. You're contradicting Christ. You're contradicting the Old Testament. You're contradicting the Bible. There's no light in you. But somebody said, but they have some good teaching over here on this thing. They have no good teaching. I guarantee if you study long enough, you'll find out that it's all false. You cannot contradict the Old Testament or the New Testament and still say there's light. If you don't agree with it, then there's error in you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. So the first test again, it has to line up with the Bible, the teaching that the person is having. 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 says, Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh is of what? God. Now again, this is where people run into some serious problem because they say, why would John says that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? He's saying that God is divine. Jesus is divine. And he came in the flesh. And if a person cannot accept this, there's no light in them. They have to accept Jesus Christ as not only the Son of God, but the divine Son of God. If they can't do this, then they're contradicting John. And if John is a prophet, which we know John is the writer of Art of Revelation, so he's a prophet. And if you contradict John, there's no light in you. We ain't going no further. We're done. No further need for any discussion. Amen. Jesus Christ. Another thing we find here, Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, says, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Again, if the lifestyle of the person is not in accordance with the lifestyle of the prophets, then the person can't be accepted. It can't be an immoral person teaching prophecy. Now, we personally are having some very serious problem with this. Very serious problem. We can't seem to accept this one principle here. We, we, we haven't, we're beating our head against the wall. And as Ogia says about Paul, we're kicking the pricks and it's hurting us. And I've ever, I, when I think about it, I always think about a prick on an orange tree. Have you ever seen a thorn on an orange tree? It's probably about this long and it's pointed and it's tough. It's tough. It's hard to break. And I always imagine when Christ says to, to Paul or to Saul at the time, Saul, why are you kicking against a prick? I'm always imagining kicking at it and just stabbing him through his foot every time. And he's bleeding, he's in pain, but he keeps doing it because he says, Lord, I don't care about fruits. I just know that the man preach good. Man preach so good, I just keep going. And the man is doing all kind of wickedness, but he preach good. And Christ said, why don't you stop kicking against that prick? It's killing you. It's killing you. And we're having a very hard time with it because somebody said, oh, they're preaching these doctrines, but you know when they get into certain to topic, they have it down packed and I say, how can you have it down packed? The man is teaching error and is messing up your life. So by their fruit, the fruits of their life, if the fruit is not right, then what the person is teaching is in error. So somebody says, don't you want to hear? No, I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear because life is not right. When the life gets right, then we'll listen. Because at that point, Christ is according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that a person become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Tinkling. Jeremiah chapter 28 verse 9 says, uh, The prophet which prophesy of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord had truly what? Sent him. Now this happened over and over again because we know the story of Jeremiah, which is one of the most potent stories in, in the Bible. Jeremiah is predicting that says destruction is coming to Jerusalem. Destruction is coming to Judah, Israel, and to Jerusalem. And what are they saying? Their prophets that are going out there saying, no, there's going to be peace. So Jeremiah said, look, okay, let, let's just give you, give you something from the Lord. I'm predicting that says bad times are coming. The other false prophets over there predicting that says good times are coming. If the prophets that predict that peace happen and peace happen, they're true. If peace doesn't happen, I want you to go and tell them and kill them. And there's prophets who died because of that. So this is why we had said in the Old Testament, people have come to the conclusion, old, conclusion in the Old Testament, that Old Testament is a lot of killing and murder. But no, it wasn't that. There was a lot of people dying. But they were dying because of rebellion, because of hard-deadedness. And New Testament is no different. Let me ask you this. Is there more killing of the righteous in New Testament or Old Testament? We really don't know. Because the Bible says we are killed all the day long for the Lord. Right? And in the New Testament, it seems like there was more murder of the righteous than anything else. You'll read the history, what happened after Christ died. Was it a good history or a bad history? See, it's us in the New Testament, in the, new, in the modern era, we view religion as something that, oh, we have a New Testament religion. 
in Paul's day, there was no New Testament religion. There was a new experience in the Christian church, but it was a lot of blood and gore. If you read about Paul's story, a lot of flagging. And we're told that says there's not much persecution because we don't preach and we don't live. We're not preaching anything and we're not living. No, but you're persecuting. Why are you persecuting a hypocrite? You can't persecute a hypocrite. Why persecute a person that is living a double life? Walk driving around in Rolls Royce while preaching. You don't need to persecute that person. And we know what ended up happening in Jeremiah here. It says that we find that says the prophets did, the false prophets did die, who speak peace. Because remember, imagine there's an army 10 miles away, and the prophet's saying, peace, peace, peace. When the army does come in, is he going to get caught by his false teaching also? Yeah, he's going to be surprised just the same way, because he was saying peace, and most actually he's acting as if everything's going to be fine. So when the army did come, to just slaughter him, and who always got away? It was Jeremiah. The Lord always instructed the military person that's coming, the general coming and say, secure him for me. Secure. And Jeremiah always gets secured. He didn't get killed. But the false prophets got killed because they were telling the people a lie and they got caught in a lie. So again, we're going to cover in health on Sunday, Sunday night. I'm going to talk about some things that's happening. Now somebody could say to me, Lloyd, look, you're getting people alarmed about all these drug-resistant bacteria and all these different things. Well, you could ignore it. And you could say, oh, yeah, you're, you're just taking things a little bit too far. And you'll suffer the consequences. And, you, and then you're going to have to judge and say, did the people tell you to ignore what I'm saying and preach to your peace? Are they talking the truth? Or am I talking the truth? And that's what you're going to realize. Because it has consequence. There are words and there are supernatural words, but the supernatural word has some real life consequences. And this is why we have to listen to the Bible. And so, um, and so I'm coming to the end of my presentation.